What's up, guys? <laughs> oh my God, shoes, right? Am I right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I know the pretty flashy entrance, but I work with a lot of parents, and they bring their kids to work all the time with light up shoes. And so I looked online trying to find adult sized light up shoes, and then I remembered wait, I'm an engineer, I'll just make my own shoes. So <laughs> I got the parts online and uh, I built them, and I think they turned out pretty well. <laughs> But uh, so you're not distracted from the message. Turn them off for now. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't always have this spark or this view of life that if I had an issue, I could solve it with my own hands. In fact, when I was eight years old, I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and who I was gonna be. But as you can see, I was pretty discouraged because what I had to look forward to in the third grade was over 10 years of learning stuff that other people had already figured out. You know, we had mapped the earth, we had figured out what the universe was made of, and then we had even started to explore it. So when I was eight years old, I just longed to be born in a time where there was still room for discovery and, and innovation where I could feel like Einstein or Newton with their ability to change the entire world with their minds. But for me, that time was over. And at eight years old, I had to deal with the fact that nothing would ever be measured in jasmines. <laughs> but back then, I had no idea how lucky I was to be born at the turn of the century because what lay ahead for me with the advancement of technology would open up a whole new door of opportunity and possibility. It was that same year, 1999, when I saw the movie Bicentennial Man. This movie, I don't know if you've seen it, but this movie is about, spoiler alert, <laughs> a robot named Andrew. And this, Andrew, uh, this robot named Andrew, he's purchased by this family to just help with their household chores. And despite his metal exterior, he looks like a human, and he acts just like a human. And when I saw this movie, I thought, I'm gonna build that. I'd finally found my opportunity to add something awesome to the world. And so with this newfound passion for technology, I knew, you know, it's my time to shine. You know, I stopped lamenting about the past scientific discoveries that I couldn't be a part of, and I started living for this future that I was going to build. And so, you know, I finally knew. I knew what I wanted to do. But developing advanced technology, it didn't really seem like something that people were into doing. But, you know, <laughs> I trudged on. And I went, to, I went to university, and I studied computer science. And I learned all about, you know, different types of robots called humanoids. And I'm telling you, I fell in love with them. I studied, uh, I, I focused on building devices that were intelligent, robots that adopted basic human qualities so that they could be easily incorporated into our own worlds and so that their behaviors could be modeled after our own. So in learning about the human body, I learned that we figured out how we practically do everything, but that doesn't make it any easier to try and put these behaviors into an artificial agent. So I'd love to walk you through a task that's super simple for humans, but for each specific part, the algorithm to how to put this into a robot has inspired many PhDs and many theses. So let's just start with something like taking out the garbage. So first, you have a signal in your head, whether it's your mom nagging you or your roommates yelling at you, that it's time to take it out. And so you have your garbage that you can identify and locate. That's a pretty difficult task for a robot. And you know you have full awareness of all of the obstacles in your environment, and you know is it raining, is it light, is it dark? You know all of this inherently. You know the best way to hold, grip, carry uh, the garbage, and to navigate around all of these obstacles. This is difficult for for humans. We take this for granted, but this is so difficult. And just being able to pre-plan a route incorporating all the obstacles in your environment and knowing, okay, that's my goal location and I'm gonna get there, and to execute this pre-planned route instantly, without even thinking, to accomplish my goal. These, these are all of the just tiny little details that go into something as simple as 
throwing out the garbage. So this task that I just did, removing debris, is one of the eight challenges in the DARPA Grand Robotics Challenge. And so if you can do seven more things plus throwing out the garbage, you'll win two million dollars. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> okay. So uh, in, in trying to teach robots how to do these different things, we've amassed an intense amount of digital data about the entire world, where things are, how things behave, what are the relationships. And this data is now accessible by millions of devices all around the world, laptops, robots, cell phones. Now, if we could incorporate all of these intelligent devices into a simple system, it could revolutionize the way that we live our lives. See, I dream of a data-driven day a day where everything just works. When I wake up, I don't have to pick out what I'm going to wear. Outfits are already chosen for me based on the weather, current fashion trends, my own style, and most importantly, the next meeting on my calendar. My self-driving car already has the address to my office and knows how to get me there and to avoid traffic. It's super simple. When I walk out the door, pull up my phone, and I start the engine. After a long day of work, I get a text from my kitchen saying that I'm missing ingredients for a recipe that I plan to put together that night. But again, I just pull out my phone and with a few simple clicks, there are the ingredients are picked out, paid for, and on their way to being delivered to my doorstep before I even pull into the driveway. So I have everything I need. I throw my dinner together and I even find time to squeeze in a workout. And as I'm brushing my teeth in my bathroom mirror, I can review my activity results of the calories I burned and my max heart rate and all of the details that show how hard I worked. Now that, that was easy. That is a life that I, I would love to live. And you know, having a cell phone and building these apps and incorporating technology into our daily lives, that's just the first step to a whole new world. So I'm no longer discouraged like I was when I was eight years old that there aren't enough revolutionary breakthroughs to strive towards. See, the uneasiness that I have now has a completely different cause. I'm nervous because despite the advancements of technology to date, some of the technology I showed you already exists, despite this technology and the incentive to take this first step, only 5% of the US workforce is scientists and engineers. Now, this is startling to me because, you know, okay, raise your hand if you want your own self-driving car and robotic helper. Everybody wants this. But, but, <laughs> but, but who, thank you, but who is going to do all of this work? You know, when will, you know, staying in a lab all night, punching, you know, crunching numbers, doing research, looking for a pattern, trying to find the solution, when will this ever seem more appealing than, you know, dancing on a stage and being idolized by millions of people? Who is going to do all the calculations and research, designing and testing, security reviews that are required to have this fantastic future that we all dream about? Who's going to do it? You know, we love, we love just talking about cool tech that's being researched at some university or some country around the world. We love talking about it and sharing the stories. But how often do we ever you know, reach out to our youth and say, you can have a role in building that. You know, you could be a part of creating this fantastic future. I recently graduated from college and I remember this myself. Oh, I knew what I wanted to do, so it was different for me. But students are often staring at the board, you know, sitting through lectures wondering, when am I ever going to use this? Well, let's show them, you know? Let's show them what they could do, what they could build. You know, let's not just, you know, push them to get good grades, go to a good school, get a good job. They could be so much more than that. So let's entice them with being the builders of the future of the world, right? <laughs> That's something I would love to strive for because the day that I just described, it's practically impossible without these new hands and these new minds to contribute their own creative ideas. So, if we were given an opportunity to cultivate a fresh mind so that it was rich with the desire to make impact in our world, but was actually equipped with the tools that they needed to really make that impact, we could plant three seeds. Identity, exposure, and experience. So let, let's start with self-reflection. 
Each person, each child, should be able to clearly identify and appreciate their own value. I know that everyone's not going to be an engineer, but it's the times that we spend thinking about ourselves where we can find our true passions and dreams. And these are our tools. These are the things that we can use to change the world. So once we have a strong sense of self, we can start thinking about others. We can start stepping out of the box of our own neighborhoods and gaining a new perspective and a new appreciation for other walks of life. Because you can't solve the problems of a world that you don't know about and don't understand. These experiences, they serve both to humble you and to inspire you to find out where in this world you can use your unique skill set to really make a difference. And finally, we need to revamp our education system to incorporate new learning styles and methods. We should be focusing more on experiential learning because there have got to be more examples in the classroom of what real work and real research is actually like. Students shouldn't just be, you know, reading and hearing. With all the technology we have now, they should be doing and feeling. They shouldn't be waiting until college to have their first internships or cooperative education experiences. If we expose them to different trades and different opportunities early in life, they're so much more likely to find that one thing that they absolutely love doing. And then, they can commit wholeheartedly to making a significant impact in that field. That would be wild. So these three ideals of identity, exposure, and experience are fundamental to the way that I've learned to build intelligent devices like Xbox at Microsoft. Everyone, everyone on my team knows their role, whether they're a designer or a software developer or you know, a program manager like me. We all understand what we are there to do and we can contribute to the project in unique ways. We build products for and work with people all around the globe. It's not just in Redmond, Seattle, or Redmond, Washington that we you know, turn it out ourselves. We have people from Japan and Europe and South America all contributing their fresh perspectives. And this, this global awareness enables us to know that some problems, they don't just have a one-size-fits-all solution. And so we do countless studies and the feedback that we get, it varies just as much as the life stories of the participants. And so before shipping, before releasing a product to market, we, we, we take the consoles and we put them in the hands of real people around the world. And when they get their hands on the product, they do things with it that we never even imagined. And they come back asking for features that we hadn't even considered. So we take all of this feedback of what they loved and where we could improve to make a higher quality product. So the Xboxes that you see today on shelves are much different than our original concept, but they're better because of the real experiences that people have had with them. Now, imagine for a second that we could present the world's biggest issues to our youth, knowing that we've equipped them with the inspiration and the experiences needed to actually conquer those problems. I know that the science fiction and the robots I loved so much growing up could someday be science fact. And that the data-driven day that I dream about could really be reality. By imparting this wisdom of self-awareness, of exposure to the world, and real experiences, we can prepare our youth, our next generation, to take the world to the next level of innovation. But we have to start today. We have to start right now. Because what's the future if there's no one to build it? Thank you. <laughs>